Thank you, Jesus. Oh, glory. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. I'm chasing an usher down. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory. <laughs> glory to God. Well, after that offering, you might as well chase one down. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. All the time. We're going to look at some wonderful things today. Uh, you know, but uh, even before we do, uh, you know, I, I want to take a moment because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I look around and, and, of course, we're church is family. And, you know, you've got to remember something about the year that we're in. The Lord said that it was the year of gain, transition, and victory. And, but the, the key, and he said this to me, and I, I've shared this some uh, here, but I'll share it even more, that the key was that the gain and the victory were tied to the transition. And so, as a fellowship, as a group of churches, we're in a transition. And, you know, I know that, that right now, you know, any transition, do you remember when, when you first got married, those of you that are married, what a transition that was? I mean, even, even the, the simple things. You know, if uh, you might have you been in a situation, you know, you could just go wherever you wanted to go, do whatever you wanted to do. You didn't have to check with nobody. But then you get married and you got somebody else that, that needs to go with you. Transition. Man, once you had kids, you really transitioned. Because then your life really was not your own. Right? Amen. Because, because now, you know, they got to be in bed at a certain time. They, gotta, they got things they have to do. You know, they start growing up and get involved in things. And now you got to take them to play ball. You got to take them to the play. You got to take them to do this and that. Well, the point that I'm making is, and that transition just continues. And when you're in that transition, if you don't understand and comprehend that, you know what, it's going to get easier. It's, it's going to get smoother. All the, all the areas that are a little a little up and down, they're going to get smoother because you're transitioning. This is where we're at as a, as a, as a church body, is we're transitioning, all right? Now, um, I told the Lord, well, the Lord dealt with me about this, and I said I told the Lord, and, and I'm just going to share it with you very quickly as He did before we get into the message. But you, some of the things that we're facing with this transition is remembering that in the Kansas location, we're celebrating 20 years of pastoring there. Now, the issue was this. We had a, if I can say it this way, we had a situation set up that was going to ease into the transition and really place Pastor Michelle and I here together all the time. I mean, except for maybe one or two Sundays a month. Well, the more I pursued that situation over the year, the more of a red light I got about it. It didn't make sense to me. Because this is something that, that I had talked about doing for years. Not just, not just this year, last year and the year before. And the more I pressed into it, Pastor Michelle and I would sit down and she'd try to talk to me about it. And I'd said, I said, I'm getting a red light. I, this is just, I don't know why. But it's, and it made no sense. All right, with the people that were involved, it made, it made no sense. Well, one day I was uh, talking on the phone to a certain person. And it wasn't anything sinful, anything bad. But once I talked to them, there was a change of direction. They, they had changed direction. Now I knew why I was getting a red light. Well, then everything that we had planned and everything that we had decided that we were going to do, now it's gone. And so it, it, it took me back to having to be there. You understand what I'm saying? on a more consistent basis. Now, the point is, is this. So we get through the transition. It's going to smooth out, and we're going to get through the transition. Amen. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? Yes. And God is giving us ideas and ways to do that. Part of that is, is uh, uh, aviation. Because that, that will make it, because the reason why, the reason why that, that I'm gone so much 
is it's, it's hard on Pastor Michelle to travel with the baby. All right, and, and I know that we have wonderful people here that help with the baby, and, 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 and I understand that. But if she's going to Kansas City, Lily's got grandparents that are there that want to see her, and, and so we have things set up. But the point is, once we get this aviation thing hammered out, then uh, Pastor Michelle can fly down on Sunday morning, fly back Sunday evening, and the baby just stays here with me, which I don't mind that a bit. But then when I need to go, I just jump in the plane, fly down on Sunday, fly back Sunday night. Now, the Lord's even kind of changed that somewhat. In the beginning, we thought we were really looking at, you know, just purchasing a plane. And then the Lord began to talk to us through several people about chartering an aircraft. And uh, I've got the contracts on my desk right now to do this. And, and God's opened up incredible, uh, Lord, that's a, forgive me, people of faith builders, that's a bad word. I shouldn't use that word. Uh, there's nothing incredible about God. And that means that He's not credible. So forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Uh, he's opened up some amazing doors in, in that area to, to hook us up with the right people. And the people that we were talking to, actually the man actually went and purchased an aircraft. And he said, I purchased this aircraft because I think it would be perfect for what you want to do. Amen. One of the reasons, he said, is it would be perfect for what you want to do. I'm going to be meeting with him this week to get that thing hammered out and get the lease signed. And then I'm believing we're going to take our first flight next month. And it's, 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 it's going to work out really well because Pastor Michelle will be able to fly down for faith explosion and then fly back. So uh, God's so good to us. But here's what, here's what I need you to do. Number one, I need you to keep your faith out there because we're pressing into it. And uh, I'm here all week. Now I'm here generally Tuesday through Friday in the office, uh, if, when I'm not in Kansas, Monday through, Monday through Thursday, Tuesday through Thursday if I'm out of town, and Monday through Thursday, and every Wednesday night. And so uh, we're, we're doing everything we can do for you to see my face <laughs> consistently, all right? And I appreciate, you know, uh, uh, when people say, you know, you miss me and you want me to be here, and I, I, that means so much. You know, it's good to come back home, people missed you. Uh, you come back home, people are kind of like, eh, you know, you, you just, you know, hallelujah. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, all right. Praise God. But we're pressing into it. And so, you know, as you give into the aviation fund and as you do that, that's then something that's just going to be ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. And God's going to continue to bless us. Amen? Amen. So praise God. Romans chapter 10. And I want to continue with this that I've been on. Uh, the subject of faith never fails. And this will actually be the second part here. Uh, I've actually ministered this on two other occasions in the Kansas location. And I say this just because I, I want you to understand how God does things. I told my wife, I said, I'm so glad that I started ministering this before Southwest Believers. And uh, she said, why? And I said, well, because the first message Keith Moore preached, he took every sermon and every thought that I had and just preached it. <laughs> but I got it on CD that I preached it first. All right? But, but here's the point. People of the same camp that you're a part of, they'll be preaching the same thing. And they might be in New York or Texas or wherever, and they're preaching the same thing because it's a flow of the camp you're in. You understand? Yeah. And we are in the Word of Faith camp. Yeah. And we'll be firmly there till Jesus returns. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But this subject of faith never fails, this came up to me. The Lord started dealing with me about this. And I'll be real honest with you. Because, uh, you know, I've, I've had people in the past that say, well, they were believing for something. And then it didn't manifest. And I would hear this phrase. Well, they had a faith failure. That bothered me. Because faith doesn't fail. You know, people say, well, you know, Jesus prayed and said, told Peter, I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail. Well, but he wasn't talking about faith for a thing or faith for healing. He was talking about your conversion, what your faith in me. Because he knew Peter was going to deny him three times. He knew the, the pressure that he was going to be under. And he said, Peter, I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail. And when you're converted, do you remember that? 
do what? Strengthen the brethren. In other words, when you see that I really was who I say I am, then you strengthen the brother and you keep them together. He wasn't talking about faith like you and I think about faith in the sense of I'm believing for this. And people say, well, that, 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 that person had a faith failure. I've seen people before uh, be diagnosed with a disease. And somebody would say, well, you know, they'll say, well, I'm believing God and I'm standing. And then maybe they, they for whatever reason, they died and moved to heaven. Somebody would say, well, they had a faith failure. No, they didn't. Because faith doesn't fail. Do you see this? And uh, faith doesn't fail for three very good reasons. I'm going to give them to you. And not going to spend a lot of time on them because uh, uh, you can go to the downloads page and get the first CD or, or request it. But faith doesn't fail for three very important reasons. Number one, right here in Romans 10, 17, we see that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith doesn't fail for the first reason. Because it comes from and is based on the Word of God. Faith comes from and is based on the Word of God. Anything that comes from and is based on God's Word cannot fail. For instance, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. Is that what it says? So if someone believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, they'll be saved. That never fails. Never fails. Pastor Larry was talking about bringing all the tithe into the storehouse, among other things. But he talked about tithing. Well, tithing doesn't fail. There are people that will say, well, I tithe and nothing's changed. Well, right there's the problem. Because you're having what you say. See, that doesn't fail either. Because it comes from the Word. So faith comes from and is based on the Word of God. Number two, the second reason faith never fails, is the faith we have is God's faith. Mark chapter 11, verse 23, or 22, Jesus said, have the faith of God, King James. The center column reference says, have the faith of God. Almost every other translation says, have the, have the God kind of faith, Amplified Bible, or have God's faith. So the faith that I have been given is God's faith. Well, nothing that's from God fails. Amen. Nothing. Thirdly, the faith we have was personally given to us by God. Romans chapter 3, or excuse me, chapter 12 and verse 3 says, He does not want any man that is among us to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to each man the measure of faith. So God has dealt to each man the measure of faith. Now, Charles Capp said the measure of faith was your Bible and that the same measure was available to everybody. Uh, there are others that say, well, that measure of faith is a measure of saving faith. Well, it doesn't matter to me if you believe this is the measure, you believe you had a measure of saving faith. The point is God dealt to everybody the measure of faith. God dealt. Nothing that God gives us fails. Do you see this? So when someone says that person had a faith failure, they are at least misinformed. At the very least, they're misinformed. Amen. And... On the other end of the spectrum, they probably don't know what faith is. If you'll remember, I told you this story. Uh, Brother Jim Molson, who is uh, an associate minister there at the Kansas location, and him and his wife, here a couple years ago, they really went through a, a challenge. I mean, uh, her heart, she was having trouble breathing and couldn't understand what was going on. She would walk and, and just get out of breath, and she didn't understand. And she went to the doctor, and the doctor kept saying it was her gallbladder. Now, that's why you're having problems with gallbladder. Well, what they didn't know is her heart was retaining fluid. And uh, her heart, now, I'll give you these numbers. A, no, a normal heart is at like uh, 0.9 on a fluid retention level. All right, that's the size. Her heart was at 0.899. It had so expanded with fluid, it was crushing her lungs and she wasn't able to breathe. It was filling up her entire chest cavity. 
And uh, she was at a ministry event in Ellsworth, Kansas. Her and another woman had went there to minister for the church. And she was coming back to her hotel and, and was blacking out in the hallway. They didn't, we didn't know that her heart was, was failing. Well, her husband took her to the emergency room when they got home a night or so later, and she did die. She, uh, she was in the, in the uh, room there waiting on the doctors to come in, and her eyes rolled back in her head, and she died. And she's, and she's written a book recently about that, uh, uh, but she said she came back to her husband, Jim, telling her, no, in the name of Jesus, you stay with me. And he called her back, and she came back. Well, here's my point. Is so the doctors, now I don't know the name of the disease, but it's an idiomatic disease. And that's a nice way of saying we don't know where it comes from or what causes it. All right, but the heart starts retaining fluid. The doctors say the largest percentage of people that get this, number one, they become totally disabled. They got to quit working. They got to quit a normal life. The second thing that they said was, was a lot of those people die. Well, you know, once you give up, Right? Once you start saying, I'm this or I'm that, and, and I got this, right? It's just a matter of time. Well, here's the point. I called him one day. We had, we had, we had walked through it, and God had done a miracle, and, uh, but we were still walking it out. And I called one day. He was up in the intensive care unit. And I called him, and I said, Jim, tell me what's the good word. He said, Carrie's healed and doing fine. I said this, based on what scripture? Now, here's why I said that. I knew they said they were in faith. I knew they weren't in faith. You hear what I'm saying? In our camp, in, in the Word of Faith camp, you, we hear this a lot. Well, I'm believing. I'm standing. I'm in faith. Based on what? See, faith doesn't fail. And when someone says, well, I'm believing, I'm in faith, I'm believing God, but then it doesn't manifest. Well, now think about this for a moment. There's three elements at work here. God, His Word, and you. Somebody missed it, and it wasn't the first two. It wasn't God. Now, I know in, the, in this day of hyper grace, people have a problem with that. Well, you don't want to tell people there's something wrong with them. Well, who's it wrong with? If it's not us, who is it? If I didn't miss it, who missed it? God? The Word didn't work. That's, why, and that's what it was. The Word didn't work. No, the Word always works if we work it. Is that right? Now, we looked at some... Now, the, the end result of that was they got a hold of the Word. And she went from having to have a, uh, uh, a drip line in her chest, that they, they, they ran a, a pick line, you know, under her arm, and it would drip medicine on her heart 24 hours a day and keep it from retaining fluid. She went from that, the doctor said she'd be on that all of her life, and then she said, is there a pill? He said, well, there is a pill, but I don't think you would qualify for it. She said, I'm going to go on that pill. And it was a, a few months after that, that medicine dripping on her heart started making her sick. And now she's on the pill. And she says, now her question to her doctor is, when can I come off this pill? And he says, well, they, you probably never will. She said, I'll be the first. And so we're waiting on that manifestation. But, you know, she, she went back to work. She's exercising. doing every, the, every time she sees the doctor, the doctor goes, you amaze me. I'm astounded by your progress. Well, what's the, what's the issue? It, folks, it wasn't luck. It wasn't that they just, God decided to smile on them. They got in faith. They got in faith about it. It wasn't just, this is what I want. This is what I would like to see happen. Very often when people say, well, I'm believing, they're saying, this is what I would like to see happen. This is what I want to happen. But see, that's different than having faith that it's going to happen. Am I helping you? So we looked at some reasons people have failed in their faith stand. And, and again, the, the, you can go to the downloads page and get the first message. But uh, I'll give them to you real quickly because we've got three more that we want to get into this morning. Number one, failure to rightly divide the word. A failure to rightly divide the word. 
You know, Paul wrote Timothy, and he said, Study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So notice how, how rightly dividing the word of truth comes, by studying the word, by knowing what's in the word. And, and many people don't rightly divide the word. They're, they're, they're in what they call a faith stand, but their faith has failed because they didn't rightly divide the word. And I use the illustration from Mark chapter 11, verse 23, where Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. And that person will say, Well, I'm healed, I'm well, I'm whole in the name of Jesus. But then two days later, they're saying, I feel sick, I'm in pain, I'm weak, I don't know what's going on. A failure to rightly divide the word. See, it's more than just you're canceling out what you're saying. It's to, to fail to rightly divide the word is to understand this. You can't have the good if you're constantly saying the bad. But yet people try to say, I'm healed, I'm well, I'm whole. And then at the other side of their mouth, say, I'm sick, I'm in pain, I don't feel good. When you rightly divide the word, you understand you have whatever you say. Is that right? Amen. Number two, why some fail in their faith stand. A misunderstanding of corresponding action. Now, people will say, and they're real heavy about this, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. You have to take the proper corresponding action. You cannot take full corresponding action. Some people cannot take full corresponding action in a situation because their faith has not grown to the level to take full corresponding action. Amen. Amen. That there, there, are people, there are people that believe if you're in faith about something that you're going to take some drastic measure. I, and I hear this all the time. People talk about being in faith. I'm going to quit my job and live by faith. Well, who says that's living by faith? Did God tell you to quit your job? Listen, listen if you can't exercise your faith right now, for increase with a job, you'll never exercise your faith for increase without a job. Amen. Because you got a check coming in every week. You got to start exercising your faith to increase what you have. Amen. Or somebody will say, well, if, if you believe you're healed, then you'll just come off all your medicine. Well, where's that written? That That's corresponding action. Well, if you believe you're healed, I just believe you shouldn't go to the doctor. Well, people have died believing that mess. Going to the doctor doesn't affect your faith. Taking medicine doesn't hurt your faith. Not going to the doctor or coming off your medicine doesn't prove you're in faith. Amen. Well, that person, that person just has more faith in Tylenol than they do in God. That's dumb. You know, that's just a dumb statement. Nobody in their right mind has more faith in medicine than they do in God. It's, 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 it's an issue of maturity where your faith is concerned. You might be mature enough in your faith to just believe God without going to the doctor. Praise God for that. But you don't put your level of mature faith off on everybody else. Everybody's not where you're at. If you're there, everybody's not where you're at. Amen. Do you see that? Hallelujah. Well, you know, I just, I just believe, I just believe if you're healed, bless God, then you're healed, and you can just throw all your medicine away. That's not necessarily the proper corresponding action. What if taking that medicine holds those symptoms down long enough where you can really get a hold of God and believe God? Amen. Do you see that? Lack of understanding of corresponding action. 
See, you, a lot of times we hear stories and we don't hear the back story. We hear the, the, what was wrong and the end result. You know, people will hear Brother Copeland talk about the $6 million debt that they were in. You'll hear George Pearson talk about how he was a $6 million man. You know, he was, he was the ministry president when that $6 million of debt came in. And then they'll talk about how in a matter of months, God paid that $6 million off. Well, he sure did. But here's the back story. They also called their staff together and had to lay some people off. They went off some television stations. Oh, holy hush fills the room. <laughs> See, because did God pay the money off? Yes, He did. He did a, a, a dramatic miracle. But they took natural steps not to help God out, but to do their part. Well, what were those natural steps? Proper corresponding action. You know, if you, if you do your monthly budget, and you should do a monthly budget, uh, thank you for that overwhelming response. Amen. Amen. Uh, a, a lot of people can't prosper because they have no idea what they have. Well, that's a whole other teaching. When you do your monthly budget, here, here's just the, the X's and O's of it. If the income level's here and the outgo level's here, you're not going to prosper. you got to take some corresponding action. You probably need to quit going out to eat. You need to quit going to the movies. You might check and see if you can live without cable. You and boil everything down to the bare essentials and then start believing God. It's hard for your faith to function on the level that it should function when you're constantly under so much pressure that you just got to pray in tongues and believe God for every dime. But when you can, you can loosen the shirt collar, so to speak, a little bit and go, and breathe, then it's easier for you to, to use your faith. Amen. Well, I know we don't have enough money, but here's just what I'm going to do. I'm just going to believe God. It's not working right now. Am I helping you? Amen. You need to begin to believe God, number one, for wisdom, where those things are concerned. I could say they're all service, but I won't. Number three, trying to harvest too early. Trying to harvest too early. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew that the kingdom of heaven is as a seed that a man puts in the ground. And it says that he sleeps and rises night and day and the, and the, and the earth bringeth forth and bud and he doesn't understand how. But it says it brings first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. There are a lot of people in the faith stand and they're trying, to, they're trying to harvest the blade. And when you try to harvest the blade, you kill your future. There, there's nothing on the blade. You know, when that, when that summer or winter wheat comes up and it's just about an inch, inch and a half above the ground, they don't pull the combine out and go harvest it. You'll kill everything. You wait until it's yay high. And it's got what on the end? Fruit. When you see the full fruit. You ever go to a salad bar and you see them little mini corn ears of corn? Well, I mean, they're, they're okay, I guess, if you like that. Man, but I like that long ear. That you can put some pepper and butter on. Whoo! Boy, that'll wrap your tongue around your eye teeth. You'll go blind for a minute. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. I mean, fresh off the grill in the shook. Whew. Oh, my. Anyway, see, that's the full corn in the ear. That other, it might be okay, but it's not the full corn. You don't get the full revelation of the ear of corn. Right? You, you'll kill the fruit. Amen. Ever ate a green apple? Not a green apple, you know, that, that's supposed to be green. I mean, an apple that's too, not, not ripe enough yet, and you bite into it. It sure enough is an apple, but you sure talk funny after you eat that apple. 
right? It's so bitter and tart. It's an apple, but you got it too early. This is what causes a lot of people to f supposedly fail in their faith stand. Now, you're there at Romans 10, 17. We're going to look at the fourth thing today. Notice it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the things of God come by hearing the word of God. So the fourth point, the fourth thing, why some seemingly fail in their faith stand, is a failure to retain the word that is heard. A failure to retain the word that is heard. Hearing the word causes faith to come, but faith functions through the word you keep. It comes by hearing, it grows by use, and it goes by saying. And so I can hear the word and faith shows up, but then I have to hold on to it. Because that's what my faith is going to consistently draw from. Look at Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 and verse 1. Oh, glory. I feel like preaching today teaching. Well, I got full. I just prayed in the Holy Spirit six hours yesterday, just all the way down, just prayed in the Holy Spirit. Listen to Brother Hagin, prayed in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Now, probably not all six hours because there were, of course, a few minutes that was, but, but the point is, the, the point is getting full. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 2, 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Now, stop right there. How's faith come? By hearing the Word of God. Now Paul says, the things you have heard, you have to give even more earnest heed to them. Lest at any time, now notice the verbiage, we should let them slip. Now very often, especially in our circles, the emphasis is placed on Mark chapter 4, that immediately Satan comes to steal the Word. Well, he comes to steal the word, but that verse does not say he has to be able to do it. Amen. It says there was a group of people that he was able to do that to. He didn't say it happened every time. But Paul says here, who I believe wrote Hebrews, if you don't believe that, that's fine. But notice what he said. Lest at any time we should let them slip. So ultimately, I'm in charge of holding on to the word I hear. I'm in charge of that. That word slip, it means to slip my mind. To slip my mind. Or to carelessly pass. Carelessly pass. Like you're just passing something carelessly. You just, it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean anything. Probably my favorite definition is to run out as leaking vessels dissipate you know if you set a, a bucket of water outside for any length of time ever how long it is that water is going to begin to evaporate it's just how it works you know the word of God in your heart he said you got to hold on to it because it's possible for it to run out and, and besides that, you're always making a debit on that word. You're depositing it, but then what you deposit, you're debiting. Because you're, every day is a what? A faith day. And so every day you're using your faith. And if you're using your faith every day, then you're using the source of your faith every day. So every day when you get up and you're using your faith, then you're using, you're using the substance that produced your faith. Hallelujah. So it's up to me to hold on to the word that I've heard. I've got to hold on to it. I have to consistently build it back up in my heart. And many fail to hold on to the word, and the result is that they don't receive the manifestation of what they said they're believing for. Amen. Because it's faith, and, and, and I don't want to get too much into this because it's another message, but you know, faith is a stand. 
Faith is a standing on the Word of God. Paul likened it to this. Faith is a fight. The fight of faith. And people say, well, it's a good fight. It is a good fight because it's a fight of faith. But it's still a fight. And in that fight, you got to be holding on to something. Amen. You got to be standing. Listen, there are times in your life that you would have just fell completely apart had you not held on to a word God gave you. No matter what it was, whether, whether it was a word that you saw in your study, a word that God gave you through somebody, something you held on to it and it brought you out. Amen. I, I'm, I'm reminded in, in this area right here, a man came one time, a person came to uh, the church and the Lord just did a miracle in his, his life. I mean, just miraculous is, is what... The only way I can describe it. And, uh, uh, well, you know, eventually it looked like things were headed the right direction, and they were. But, you know, eventually this person passed away. And they passed away from what, uh, you know, we were believing that, that God had healed them of. And, you know, as a pastor, you go to the Lord and you start praying about those things. And the Lord just kept helping me see this. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Everybody you know doesn't know what you think they know. Amen. I had a minister friend of mine tell me about a person that he went to see that was sick that had been in their church for over 20 years, had sit under their ministry for over, over 20 years, had heard them teach on healing, saw miracles, and they went in the house to pray for this person. And one of the first things the person said to them was, I, well, you know, I just don't know if it's God's will to heal me. Maybe He is trying to show me something through this. They had sit under the Word of Faith for 20 years. And people say, yep, the devil stole the Word from them. Or they let it slip. See, you can't blame the devil for everything. There are people who say, well, the devil killed that person. Or they let slip the word. Well, glory. Yes, he's a murderer. He's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Bible also says, if I stand firm and steadfast against him, that he'll flee from me. If I don't hold on to the Word, then there's nothing to base my faith on, and I can't be in faith. Because, because the Word sets on a foundation, or faith sets on a foundation of the Word. Do you see that? That's what it sits on, to take me where I need to be. If I lose the foundation, faith falls apart. Oh, glory. I was talking to a, a brother one time, and he, was, he, was, he called me. He was having heart problems, and he called me. And uh, he's, he's, he was a leader, and so he had my number, and he called me. And he began immediately telling me, oh, Pastor, this is what's going on, but this is, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm declaring. This is what I'm confessing, and I want you to be in agreement with me. Now watch that. Be careful with that. I couldn't be in agreement with him because I heard fear in his voice. I've, I've learned a few things over the years. I don't know everything. As Brother Hagin said, I may not know much yet. But I've learned this. You don't just jump in there and grab a hold and say, Yep, I'm in agreement, I'll agree, I'll agree. I'll... You don't know what you're agreeing with. And I stopped for a moment and just kind of prayed in the Spirit under my breath. And I called his name, I said, uh, I'll agree with you, but we got to clear something up first. I said, you're in fear. You're not in faith about this. You're in fear. Well, how dare you presume whether somebody's in faith or not? Well, I could hear fear. Presence of fear means the absence of faith. Is that right? When, when Jesus, when the disciples were in the boat and they, with Jesus and they woke him up to calm the winds and the waves, he turned on them after calming the winds and the waves and said, where's your faith? 
How is it you're so fearful? Right? And I said, we, we got to clear this up. And I started talking the word to him. Now, you know this. Your heart safely trusts in him. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Now, God brought you out of this, and he's going to bring you out of this other. What are the doctors saying? Well, the doctors are saying they need to do this. I said, do you have peace about that? He said, I do. I have perfect peace about it. I said, okay, let's get in there and believe for that then. And he went through the procedure and everything turned out all right. See, I'm firmly aware that people can die if you just jump out there and say, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you. Everything's going to... I don't know if they're where they need to be in their faith. Oh, my. Do you see that? Because, because human nature, especially when we know some things about faith, human nature becomes this, that, that if there's something that we're, we're afraid of or something that we have a uh, hesitation about, we tend to avoid that by saying we're in faith. When in reality, I'm afraid of the circumstance. And i got to take time to just pray in the Holy Ghost. Because see, faith, a failure to retain the word heard. Amen. I knew he hadn't retained what he'd heard. That's not an indictment. It's not running anybody down. It's you're locating people and trying to figure out, are they in faith? Sometimes people will just say what you think, what they think you want to hear. That's not faith. Faith is honest. If somebody says, well, what are you believing for? And you're, and you're not sure that, that you're <laughs> believing for what they, may think you, they ought, what they may think you should be believing for, you just say honestly what you're believing for. Amen. Are you following me? Failure to retain the word heard, it's up to me to hold on to it. I got to hold on to the word. I got to keep it going in my ears, keep it coming out of my mouth, keep it going in my eyes, and then hold on to it. Do you see that? Number five, not being united to the word by faith. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore let us fear, lest a promise being left of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the word preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. The center column reference says, not being united by faith to the Word. I have to be united by faith to the Word that I hear. Faith is that substance. Faith comes for the purpose of uniting me to the Word. That's what makes it solid. That's what makes it real. Until faith comes to you about a certain thing in the Word, that's just words to you. It's not real. When faith shows up, now you're united to the Word by faith. Amen. Without being united to the Word by faith, the Word can't affect a lasting change in my life. And see, those, those are those bywords that we come up with. Well, I know I'm in faith. Well, how do you know? Are you united to the Word? Are you sure? Are you completely sure? Are you, are you convinced? Do you know that you know that you know that you know that that cannot fail? If that's where you're at, you're in faith. If you're not there, you need to keep building your faith. See, that's why faith requires honesty. Pastor Michelle asked me one time, she said, I need you to believe with me about this. I said, I can't believe with you about one more thing. 
And she, <laughs> amen. I said, my faith rack is full right now. I don't have room for one more thing. Oh, pastor, you should have just believed with her. No, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie and tell you that I have faith to believe with you when my faith is stretched to its limit. Oh, glory. Now, I can agree with you about what you believe. Well, I, I just believe, I just believe if you have faith, you can just believe whenever you want. Well, well that's not Bible. Remember Romans 12, 3, according to the measure of faith? Well, the Bible says some people have little faith. Well, I don't care what you think about little. Little implies not much. And so they, they only have a little bit. Amen. Kind of like Brill Cream. A little dab will do you. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Some things you say you just date yourself. You just, right? Amen. Like I said something to somebody the other day. I said, you remember this, don't you? They go, no. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. You know what that means? I'm getting some wisdom. Because now I know things that other people don't know. <laughs> but a little bit. So that little faith will carry you a little ways. But, but, right? but then the Bible says there's growing faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Exceedingly growing faith. Faith. Then the Bible says there's great faith. The Bible says there's weak faith, strong faith. The Bible says there's unfeigned faith. All right? In, in other words, you know, feigning is fake faith. So the Bible says, Paul wrote Timothy and said, there's, there, there is people that have faith that's not fake. It's real. Jesus said there are people that have no faith. Well, Pastor, I'm a Christian. I've got to have faith. Well, Jesus said it's possible to be a Christian and not have any faith. Hallelujah. I've looked at people before and tried to agree with them and just knew they don't have a lick of faith. Well, what do you got to do? You got to spend time building them up. Why? Because it's, listen, you've got to be united to the Word by faith. It's not enough just to hear that God wants to heal you. It's you being united with that word by faith. Oh, glory. Without being united to the word by faith, the word can't affect a lasting change in my life. No, notice Hebrews 11.1. 1. You know this verse, but notice. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen and I always say yet, because it's coming. But notice, faith is the substance, the grounds. In, in other words, faith is the grounds you have for believing what you believe. Faith is the conviction. One translation says the title deed of what you're believing for. Or the thing hoped for. And we're going to get into that in the next point, the thing hoped for. But the, do you know the title to my car is what unites me to that car? If I've got a title, I have a car. You can be driving a car and not have a title for that car, and you are in no way united to it. You cannot prove that it's yours. You can have, you can have a, a, a personalized license plate that says this is your car has your name on it. You can have monogram stitching on the dashboard. Larry Clemens. And the officer says, can I see the title? I don't have it. He's going to say, step out of the car, sir. Right? Because you're driving a car that you have no proof belongs to you. Right? There, there, there are people, not you now, I hope, but people <laughs> that will talk the word, but they've never given enough time to it for faith to come. So they're not united to the word. Knowing what's in the word and what's in the word being a part of you are two different things. 
The Word has to become a part of you. Remember, the Bible says, receive the engrafted Word that's able to save your soul. Engrafted. It becomes a part of you. It becomes engrafted in you. Jesus said, if any man hear my sayings and does them, I'll show you who he's like. He's like a man that dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock, and then when the storms came and the winds blew and the flood rose, they beat against that house, but it didn't fall because it was founded on a foundation, on a rock. The rock is the Word of God. And when you build a house on the foundation, that house becomes united with the foundation. And ever how strong the foundation is determines how strong the house is. But he said, I'll show you who he's like that hears, the, hears, hears, hears these words and doesn't do them. He's like a guy that built his house on sand. And the same storm came. The same winds blew, the same flood beat against that house, and it says great was the fall of it. Now see, here's the answer. People say, well, I sat with that person in church for years. I know they heard the word. How could, they, how could their faith fail like that? It didn't. Jesus gave us the answer. Somebody was founded on the word, and somebody wasn't. Now I know we don't like to think this way. But it's, it's, it's the truth nonetheless. You know, I've raised uh, four kids working on a fifth one. <laughs> and you know, there were times that I promised something to all the kids if they would do something. And there were times that one or two of them would do it and one or two of them wouldn't. And the two that didn't do it wanted the reward. And I had to say, no, you can't have it. Why? You didn't do what you were supposed to do. Amen. That's why you have people in any setting. In a setting like this. You'll have four people on the same row. Three of them will receive. One of them won't. They all heard the same word. But somebody, the three, took it home and planted it in their heart and became united to it by faith and faith always produces the desired results. Well, I don't understand. They heard the same word. They went through FBIMA. You know, it used to bother me. Because people go through my Bible school and backslide. You went through my Bible school. Right? How did you? Amen. I had a valedictorian, valedictorian of the class, went through Bible school, seemed so fired up over the things of God, and then backslid. Went back in the world and ended up in prison. Well, how'd that happen, Pastor? The Word wasn't united to their heart by faith. Has nothing to do with who's preaching it. Listen, if you can't get faith from my preaching, I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm joking. Not prideful at all. I'm joking. It, it doesn't matter who's preaching. You, you can sit under Ken Copeland. You can sit under Pastor Caldwell. You can sit under anybody. Amen. And if you don't, if you don't retain the word that was heard and you don't become united to it by faith, it's not going to affect you. Oh, it'll sound good, but it won't change anything. I knew a person one time that we were dealing with was sick in their body. And somebody kept saying, something somebody said one time from, from their family, they said, they said uh, well, maybe we need to take them and let one of the big guys lay hands on them. Thank you for your confidence. <laughs> Amen. You can have the big guys rub your head with oil till you turn bald-headed. And, and if, if you're not letting the Word be united to your heart by faith, I don't care who prays for you. You're only, you're only going to get healed in my services because you believe you're going to. Paul said, our faith stands in the Word of God, not in men. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> 
It was like the lady one time, Mark Hankins was in our church, and he, he's told this story. And he said there was a lady that was in their church, and they had an evangelist come in. And she didn't think too much of him. And uh, so she was going to say she didn't think too much of him. And before he got up to preach, true story now, before, she got up to pre before he got up to preach, uh, the lady stood up and said, I have a word from the Lord. said, okay. And she began to, to prophesy to this evangelist. And she said, yes, my son, thou thinkest that thou art a humdinger. She said, but thou art not a humdinger. Thou art but a dinger. <laughs> so, True story. <laughs> Need to get your hum back. A humdinger. Now I can't tell that everywhere because people don't understand colloquialisms. But the, 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 point is, the point is with the story is everybody is not where you think they are. <laughs> she didn't quite think he was a humdinger. Just a dinger. The, the key is, according to Paul, is examine yourself and see if you're in, in the faith. Amen. My faith is what unites me to my healing. My faith is what unites me to my prosperity. Your faith is what unites you to the promise where things are concerned. And, and you've got to understand that when you're operating your faith in certain areas, you're op for instance, you're, when you're operating your faith where your family is concerned, you're dealing with people that have a will. And you have no promise in the Word of God that your faith is going to change their will. None. Well, I want you to agree with me that my son will be saved. Well, that's always right to agree, but he's got a will. But I'll hear people say, well, I just believe it, so that's how it's going to be. Maybe not. Because that person has a will. And you're not just going to wait in there and change everything because that's how you want it to be. Hmm. Let me move on. Do, do you see that? Now, if they believe what you're saying, you can help them. But if they, if they, if they don't believe it, you... You're not going to change a person's will. God's not going to come down and heal somebody against their will. He's not going to save anybody against their will. If that was the case, then we'd just name and claim right here today that every sinner in Little Rock is going to be saved and they're all going to come to church here tonight. Be wonderful. Except we don't have enough room. There are many of us in here. If we could do that with our children, we'd do it right now. We'd just declare the word over them. You're saved. Nothing you can do about it. You're saved in Jesus' name. And we'd have them right here sitting by us tonight. And that would be wonderful. Yeah, but the Bible promises. The Bible promises you that you can believe for the peace of your children and you can believe for them to be saved and whole according to the Word of God. And when you declare that over your family, you are, you are producing an environment that the Word of God can begin to work in their life, but they still have to believe it. Am I helping you with this? One day, one day I was praying about this because we, we had a, a child that was, that was wayward. I don't know if you've ever had that. And man, you know, this is, this is, this is your child. And oh, I was praying. <laughs> the Lord said two things to me. I was praying out on our patio in the, in the Kansas house. Oh, I was praying. I was praying hard. You ever prayed hard? Oh, God. And just praying in tongues hard. Say, baby, I'm so cold. And the Lord said to me, Philip, this is what he said. Your face is all scrunched up. I stopped praying. My face is scrunched up. He said, your expression is evidence of what you're doing. You're praying, but you're carrying the care of your child. He said, full of the Holy Ghost is supposed to be peace and joy. And then he asked me a question. He said, 
And, and he asked me these questions. He said, uh, do you think you care more about your child than I do? And I said, no, Lord, I know you don't. I know I don't. He said, what's my job in this situation? I said, save my child. He said, what's your job? I said, believe that you can do it. He said, leave it at that. If you believe in me, then leave it at that. See, now I've got to hold on to that. And that's when he spoke to me that week that my job was to declare over my child they are following the plan of God for their life. That's my job. I don't talk to him about the Lord. Now you do whatever you want to. I don't tell him you need to get in church, you need to be believing God, you're going to a devil's hell. That's not helping. My job is to declare my child is following the plan of God for their life. Now see, we're not letting go of this. Am I helping you? This is uniting me to the Word by faith. Amen. And you know, even if I die before I see the manifestation, my words never die. And so my words will linger here on the earth that my child is following the plan of God for their life. And I might have to see that they made it once we get to heaven, but I believe I'll see it. Am I helping you with this? Number six, failure to cultivate a proper picture. Failure to cultivate a proper picture. Remember Hebrews 11, 1 said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope is a picture. A picture. Or you could say it this way, a goal setter. Hope is a picture, a goal setter. When you are desiring something in your life personally, if you don't set some goals, you're going to have a hard time getting it. Because you've got to be able to measure progress. You've got to be able to track what you're doing. Amen. Hope is a picture. Faith is the substance of that picture. So without building a proper picture, there's nothing for me to add my faith to. If I don't have a goal, I don't have anything to add my faith to. Amen. Somebody will say, I'm believing God to bring me out of debt. Well, how much debt do you have? Don't know. It's not happening. <laughs> Remember I told you the story? I often tell the story about God bringing us out of debt. And I tried to always tell the back story so you'll understand. $210,000 in debt. And it would be easy to say, you know, and in nine months God brought us out of debt. Well, He did, but there were things we did. We sold some things at auction. We called some places and settled some accounts. Asked them what they would take. Amen. Settled some things, did what we needed to do, budgeted everything we had. And then it got down to $24,692.90 something cents. And we carried that remaining amount around with us. We went to the minister's conference with it. We went everywhere. Why? Because we'd heard too many stories of people standing up and saying, if you know how much debt you owe, come up here, I'll pay it off. Amen. Man, I knew. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And when I walked back in, in the church and at, in the office, and that guy texted me and said, Pastor, how much money do you need? I text back, $24,692.90 something cents. Amen. Amen. See, I had a picture. Now, now, we worked hard over that nine months. We just didn't sit back and say, I believe we're coming out of debt. And all of a sudden, poof, a debt disappeared here. And poof, over here, you know, debt genie was coming in and wiping out the debt. <laughs> you know, however you do that, right? And that, That's not how it happened. I would, like, I would like to be able to teach you that that's how it happened, but that's not how it happened. We got up every day and applied the Word. Pastor Michelle found the scripture in, in Psalms that says you bring out those that are bound by chains. And we declared that over. Now here's what I'm trying to get across to you. We had a picture of debt freedom. 
Amen. You, you have to get that picture. The Word of God paints the picture that faith unites you to. You see yourself as healed. Without the picture, there's nothing for faith to unite me to. And that's why you fight a battle with people that you're believing with. And, you, and you'll go to them and you'll get them built up in what you, you believe is faith. And it is faith to a certain extent. But they're seeing what you're saying. But then when you leave, they don't keep painting the picture. And so every six months, you got to go back and pump them up again. And they'll do real good while you're there because you're talking to them and the picture is there. And you're telling them, no, now don't say that, say this. You're not sick, you're well. Say it with me. And they'll go, I'm well, I'm whole. Well, see... There's an image, but it's your image. But God's so gracious and so merciful that He'll start working with them on your image. But then you leave and the Word departs from in front of their eyes. It quits going in their ears. It quits coming out of their mouth. And, and everything else takes its place. And now they got a picture of sick. They got a picture of broke. They got a picture of that because that's what they meditate on. I'm helping you this morning. You're, you're painting a picture. God painted a picture with Joshua. And the picture that he painted for Joshua was, everywhere you go, I'm going to be with you. And nobody will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Because as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And he said, you meditate on that. You keep that coming out of your mouth. What was he doing? Painting a picture. It never crossed Joshua's mind that Jericho wasn't going to fall. How do you know that? Because the Bible says, Hebrews 11, that he did it by faith. Anything that you're doing in faith, you're united to the Word by it. If he did it by faith, he saw the walls falling. Because that's how faith operates. It operates by the picture that hope has provided you. Oh, glory. Amen. That's how you got to see yourself. That's that you have to paint that picture. You know, years ago, and, and I'll probably date myself here too, but I still listen to him. Years ago, I heard a guy named Zig Ziglar. You might remember Zig. Yeah. Amen. And of course, his, his son, Tom, and, and his daughter, they still have that. His, uh, I call it ministry because it, it really was a ministry. And he said that, you know, uh, one day he was looking at himself. And he said, uh, this is many, many, many years ago, I, 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 when I read his book, See at the Top. And uh, he was talking about this. And he said, uh, he said uh, I noticed that I wasn't able to see my, now I'm saying what he said. Uh, he said, I noticed I wasn't able to see my shoes because I couldn't look over my stomach. <laughs> and, and he said, I started thinking, what am I going to do if somebody comes up to me and says, Zig, you know how he talks, Ziggler, don't you believe what you're saying? He said, I would say, well, what do you mean? And he said, I can just see him poking that big belly. And he said, so I decided I needed to lose some weight. And he said, he went to the doctor, went to the, the, the clinic there. <laughs> and the doctor said, you are the most in shape 65-year-old I've ever met in my life. And he said, I looked at him and said, yeah, but doc, here's the problem. I'm only 42. <laughs> And so here's, now there's, there's, there's a point to this. And he said, so here's what I did. Now, I heard this, and I know the faith principles, but it was like, ah, okay. And he said, uh, he said, I have to admit something first. He said, I stole a magazine. I stole a page out of a magazine. And uh, he said that he was sitting there flipping through the magazine in the doctor's office, and he saw this advertisement for a certain uh, uh, apparel item. And, uh, well, it was, it was jockey shorts is what it was. And... Uh, he said, I took that page out of that magazine and put it on my mirror. He said, now I didn't want to model jockey shorts. <laughs> but that was my goal. Now people say, well that's absurd. Yeah, but that's what the Bible says. If you don't have a goal, a picture. See, a lot of people claim they're in faith, but they don't know what they're in faith about. Well, I'm in faith for healing. Do you see yourself healed? 
Because the way a person talks determines, will, will tell us what they're seeing. Do I see myself that way? I, I remember listening to, to that Keith Moore song over and over again, I see me as healed. I see me as healed. I see me as healed. I got to see myself as healed. Amen. Well, the, the end result of that was, you know, eventually he, he lost all that weight and did what he needed to do. But the, the, point, the, the point that stuck with me is it wasn't the, 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 the picture on the mirror. It was that he was saying, there's something I got to do this. I got to attach my faith to something. Amen. Do you see this? It is possible to fail in receiving because of a lack of a clear picture. Pastor Larry talked in the offering today about how when he was looking at all the things he had to do and it just came out of his mouth. I am fully supplied, completely filled, rich, rich, rich. Well, those are not just words. You're not going to have it just because you say it. But saying it is involved in you having it. Well, this is how it's going to be. I said it, so that's how it's going to be. Not necessarily. Because there's two other parts there that Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three. 23. He said, you say it, yes. But then he said, if you don't doubt in your heart. And if you believe what you say, you'll have whatever you say. So if a person's saying it and it's not manifesting, could it be those other two aren't in play? It is. That's what it is. Amen. Let me hurry a little bit. Un poquito. <laughs> Look at Romans 4. Romans 4. This will be our last scripture. And you know, I've had people tell me before, well, you know, I just believe if you got faith, it's just going to happen. Well, that'd be great. But all these things that I'm telling you, you know, they're in the Bible. We're seeing it in the Bible. You know, there's not one scripture that just says, well, if you got faith, everything's going to be all right. Doesn't say that. I see things like faith without works is dead. I see faith works by love. I see believe and don't doubt. Yeah, but Jesus said all things were possible, right, to the one that believes. You see, so it is, everything is possible, and nothing is impossible to the believer. But believing and faith are action words by definition. I'm attaching it to something. Notice Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now, as it is written. Now, notice that's a parenthetical statement, and Paul is quoting what was written in the book of Genesis. And he says something here. Who against hope believed in hope. Now, against hope believed in hope. Now, how did he believe against hope and believe in hope? Two different words. Same English word, two different Greek words. The first word hope, against hope, it means a constant, consistent expectation of bad. That's what it literally means. The second word hope means a constant, consistent expectation of good. So there was a picture that caused him to expect not to be a father of many nations. He didn't focus on that picture. He believed in the picture God painted. Your descendants will be as the stars of the sky in number, as the sands of the seashore in multitude. When God called Abraham the father of many nations, Abraham was not the father of many nations. When God called him that, he was too old to have a child and Sarah was barren. What was God doing? Painting a picture. Do you see this? See, faith is not automatic. It, it requires that you do something. 
well, I'm not worried about that. I believe God's going to take care of it. He's not. Because faith is personal. It's your faith that God gave you. And you've got to use your faith. The Bible says you've got to take the shield of faith. That implies you can throw it down or you can pick it up. Amen. And so notice what he says. He had to believe against that hope. Notice how he did it. The last part of verse 18. According to that which was spoken. Is that what your Bible says? So he had this picture of not being able to have a child. That's what was there. Whatever you're believing for, that natural picture is easy to see. If you're believing for healing in your body, you know you need healing because of how you feel. Amen. Amen. But the word, when it says, by his stripes you're healed, is trying to paint a picture for you that you can believe for. And he said that the way Abraham, see, Abraham didn't have a Bible. Genesis wasn't written yet. None of it was written. Abraham couldn't go to Romans 4, 17 and say, look there, against hope I believed in hope. He had to believe God without any written evidence. Well, if God came to me and spoke to me personally, I would believe Him. If you won't believe what He wrote to you personally, you won't believe what He says to you personally. What I write you in a letter is just as real and binding as what I say to you face to face. So against hope, He believed in hope. How did he do that? According to that which was spoken. Verse 19, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Now stop there and understand. That doesn't mean he never looked at his body. I've heard people teach it that way. Abraham just didn't care about his body and he didn't. Well, that's not what it's saying. In, in, the, in the Weiss translation, the Greek, it says this. It says, he did not consider his body to be a reason God wouldn't do what He promised. He was fully aware. Right? He, he was fully aware of how old He was. He was fully aware that His wife had never been able to have children. From 18 to 90. Barren. Fully aware of that. But he kept a picture in his mind. So people say that person's faith failed. Did they have a picture? See, you don't know. What were they saying behind the scenes? Were they declaring it hot and heavy in church and then getting home and talking about how bad it was? If so, they weren't painting a picture. So faith didn't fail because faith never showed up. Amen. Oh, glory. He staggered not, verse 20, at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he was able to perform. So the process of receiving the picture into physical reality was what? Calling those things that be not as though they were. You call those things that are not like they are till they are. I'm healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what if I end up going to the doctor? Then you end up going to the doctor. That doesn't change anything. Listen, if, if, they, if they perform a surgery on you and fix the problem, you're no less healed. Now, now, I know in our, you know, our circles, well, you know, doctors can't heal nobody. Well, of course, doctors don't heal anybody. They help us as much as they can. God's the healer. Am I helping you? You know, we often talk about Miss Dodi Osteen. You know, getting diagnosis of liver cancer, kidney cancer. Doctor told her to go home and die. 
And she believed God and was healed. Praise God. You know, she got cancer a second time and went and had surgery. Because that's what the Lord told her to do. Does that make her less of a faith person? We have a personal example in our personal lives. Y'all remember the story very well. Many of y'all better than I do. Right out here on Markham, Pastor Caldwell and Miss Jeannie hit by that tire truck, broke her back in three places. And the Lord told her not to have surgery. God heal her? But when this last issue came up and they discovered she had a brain tumor, they prayed about it and the Lord said, have the surgery. Now, are you going to tell me that they had a lack of faith? You better not because you'd be lying. They put faith in what God said. Amen. And you saw her here at Faith Explosion up singing, exercising every day. Pastor said they went to Israel and he couldn't keep up with her. That was his words. And it, and it was just a few short years ago, a couple years ago, it wasn't that way. Now understand, was that an exercise of faith? Yes. What was the picture that was always being painted all throughout that ordeal? She's well. She's whole in the name of Jesus. Well and whole. Healed by the power of God. And what eventually happened? God revealed what was going on in that situation and they got it fixed. Amen. Let me hurry. i got to get you out of here. If I get you out too early, Jason's Deli will still be too crowded. <laughs> I don't want y'all to have to wait too long. What's that? Run out of that salad. Run out of that salad. That's right. I used to tell them in the Kansas location, the Baptist will beat you to the buffet. And, and uh, anyway... When you begin to declare what you're seeing in the Word, you paint that picture on the canvas of your life. And Abraham could maintain his faith and hope because he was focused on what had been spoken. This was the picture. He didn't consider any other picture that he saw as a reason God could not do what he promised. He didn't consider that picture as a reason that God couldn't do it. And very often people say, well, that, you know, that person had a faith failure and they were so strong in faith. You don't know that. Faith has a sound. And it's the sound of assurance. It's the sound of persuasion. I was talking to somebody not too long ago and I was asking them something. And I said, hey, uh, can we do this? And when they answered me, they didn't sound convinced. I said, okay, don't worry about it. You're not convinced. Well, but, 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 Pastor, no, you're not, you're not sure. And if you're not sure, we're not doing it. You say, what'd you do? I hung up. <laughs> and they called me back a little while later, and I found out why they weren't sure. I'm not, I'm not being rude, but I can hear. When you're not sure, there's a sound to it. And somebody will go, well, I'm in faith. I'm believing. No, you're not sure. Now, that, I know that's presumptive in some cases. But faith has a sound. When you would have asked Abraham at this stage in his life that Paul's talking about, are you the father of many nations? When he opened his mouth, it would have come out persuaded. If you would have asked him in Genesis 12, 13, and 14, it would have come out non-persuaded. Why? Because in those verses, God showed up to him and I said, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou, be perfect. And he said, I'm your exceedingly uh, uh, your exceeding great reward and your shield. And Abraham said to God, what could you possibly give me seeing I'm still childless? In other words, you're promising me things and you hadn't done the first thing you promised. This Eliezer is going to be my heir. And God had to say, wait a minute, let's repaint this picture. And he first of all said, no, that's not what's going to happen. One that comes out of your own body is going to be your heir. And then he said, now you take these animals and this heifer and this goat and this lamb and you split them down the middle and God made a covenant with him and walked in blood and made a promise that was based on what God promised and not on what Abraham believed. 
And then God started working on changing Abraham's image. He said, you're no longer going to be called Abram. You're going to be called Abraham. If I can't get you to see it as Abram, I'll get you to say in Father of Many Nations and paint that picture in your spirit. And he did. Amen. Amen. Abraham became fully persuaded by focusing on the picture the Word had created and allowing faith to unite him to that picture. He was united by faith to that picture. And he's the father of our faith. That's how we do it. Amen. So never, and, and there's, there's more to this because I've, I've got another message, that, that um, three more points on this. But the point is, is faith doesn't fail. And I can't allow that to stick in my mind or else when I'm trying to operate my faith, I'll think about somebody else's supposed faith failure. Hallelujah. Faith doesn't fail. And if, if, I'm, if I'm painting that picture, I'm holding on to the word that I heard. I'm retaining it. It's going to work. I really believe that. Things are going to change for you. And there's times, and sometimes we don't like this, but there's times we just got to hold on till it changes. Because it'll change. Amen. That, that's why the Bible never says standing in faith is easy. It says it's a joyful stand. It's a good fight. But even something good can be hard. Can be challenging. Amen. Let, let me end with this. You know, sometimes people will say, and I've, I've had people come up to me and they'll say, you know, Pastor, the, the things you do, the travel that you do, and, oh, that must be hard. Well, it's not easy. But what do you do? It's what the Lord asks you to do. You know, Peter said something. He said <laughs> that God, now, now watch this, after you've suffered a while, will strengthen you and establish you and perfect you. Now in the faith camp, we don't talk a lot about suffering because that's not our focus. Our focus is the goodness of God and it should be. But you know, if you're going to receive from God by faith, you're going to stand through some things. And you're going to have to do what God told you to do. Amen. There, there are things, I'm looking back on 20 years of pastoring, and you know, there were things that happened in the first year. I look back, if I hadn't been willing to stand in the first year, I had people get mad at me. I had a guy taking out newspaper ads against me, calling me a false prophet, put a, put a picture of a wolf in a sheep coat, and called me by name said I was a false prophet, was out after people's money. I wasn't getting none of his, man. He was so tight. He squeaked when he walked. <laughs> Amen. He, he printed out T-shirts about me and was wearing them around town, talking about the prosperity message and, and women preachers. Amen. All kind of things. And, you know, I wanted to defend myself. I wanted to tell people, I'm not a false prophet. What I preach works. But, you know, that would have hurt my faith. Amen. If you'll stand and be willing to stand forever, you won't have to stand very long. But you just got to set your face like a flint and determine, I'm staying in faith about this, and I'm not going to be moved out of it, and the end result will be, I'll have everything God promised me. Amen? Because you, amen. I, I know we don't, sometimes we don't like this, but you know, the Bible does say weeping might endure for a night, but it says joy is coming in the morning. Amen. There'll be some tears. There'll be some times that you're praying and you're seeking God. There'll be times you'll pray all night. And it'll seem hard and it'll seem difficult. But the sun will rise in the morning. And you will know God's on your side. And everything's going to be okay. I'm telling you. I don't know who I'm saying that for, but everything's going to be all right. 
But you're going to have to stand and you're going to have to fight the fight of faith. Don't give up now because if you give up now, you're going to give up all the ground that you've gained. Just keep the stand of faith going. Everything's going to be okay. Amen. Let's stand up today, shall we? Praise God. Did you receive anything from the Word? I believe God. Hallelujah. The devil's a liar anyway. He's not a humdinger. He's just a dinger. Amen. <laughs> oh, glory to God. We'll be back here at 6 o'clock tonight for another great faith building message. I'm so glad that you're here today. Amen. God's so good to us. Praise God. Come on, say it with me today. The vision of this church is to build people's faith and to frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.